<laughs> That's a little guide for, for, for Mr. H when he's at his scene. Stop <laughs> laughing. This is not for entertainment, madam. <laughs> <laughs> Serious stuff, you know. Serious business, okay. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> welcome, listeners of Illusion, to Temporal Discussion. This is the episode by episode retrospective nightmare podcast, and I am one half of the Gestalt entity that is known as the Two Night Martins, but I'm not and Martin it, Harder. <laughs> yeah, and it may surprise you to know that I'm not Martin Harder. I'm in fact nightmare connoisseur, voice actor, and YouTuber Amy Davis. Yes, unfortunately, Mr. H is entirely unfit for duty today due to a case of frost action. Or actually, he was just too lazy. So he said, Martin, you go and do it, will we? Uh, you know. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you with keen ears and with um, uh, a long time uh, aficionados of the Nightmare online community may well recognize Amy's voice from a couple of the Duns Helm players um, specials we put out recently. And indeed, um, from some of the uh, other Duns Helm players' plays that we've done down the years. But most of all... Yeah, thankfully with a better microphone. Thankfully with a better microphone than I used to have. Nowadays, well, so is mine. I'm not going to deny, deny my shame on that. <laughs> <laughs> but most of you will recognise her from her YouTube channel, Queen Creeps, and as the voice of Grisha McLagan in the Harry Potter fan film Voldemort origins of the air she's a bit of a star this girl and i'm i'm very proud that i discovered her ah smug mode yes. I, <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to um, bask in your reflected glory amy I don't, I, i'm entitled to do that oh yeah absolutely <laughs> go ahead <laughs> Uh, i've been looking forward to this so anyway not amy tell me what does nightmare mean to you okay so yeah, like you said, uh, Nightmare was actually my introduction to voice acting because you were the first voice acting director I worked under back when I was 13. I'm 22 now, so that was like... Director? Yeah, <laughs> Me? <Yeah. laughs> director? <laughs> I, I, well, love being massively, I love being massively overrated, but that's going too far. <laughs> <laughs> I just God. sent you the lines and just said, yeah, just speak them into the microphone and away you go. <laughs> Director. <laughs> no, I love that. But, Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I discovered Nightmare when I was about eight or nine from, because I, obviously Nightmare was past my time, but I found them on the challenge reruns. And then when I was 12 years old, I just Googled it one day and found the forums and everything like that. And then I had to wait until I was 13 to actually join them. But to me, it was my first big creative outlet because I got involved with Dunsound Players. I started writing my own fan fiction and stuff. And at the time, I was one of those people who would like rewatch things over and over again to get every single detail. So I think it was one of the first big shows that I was invested in. I like yeah. wanted to know everything like that and Raven as well, but Nightmare was a really big one. So I, I often it's think like... Raven was almost um, copied from Nightmare in many ways. <laughs> it's, it's an awfully, <laughs> including a very similar looking host. Inspired. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Took inspiration from <laughs> Nightmare. <laughs> So, Amy, I have to ask yes. you, because, because it's a tradition and it's one that's always on my mind, uh, did you ever watch the 1987 gangster film The Untouchables? I didn't know. My friends have been speaking about it recently, but no. <laughs> 
you're one of us. We, we're yes. basically the, 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 the running subject of discussion is um, we can never be bothered to watch it. So, I mean, we, re we really struggle to find any guest speaker who will actually admit to watching it. So, oh, crazy. <laughs> so there you go. So today um, we're looking at series two, episode three, which is first broadcast on September the nineteenth, nineteen eighty-eight which is uh really shocking to me because i can still remember watching it as lie as as new um you don't remember it um as no. new because you weren't around was, back then i was minus 10 years old <laughs> oh the excuses you come up with not to do your homework <laughs> uh, but yes uh, <laughs> yes it was um i do actually remember it remember quite vividly watching it um mm. the very first time it was broadcast so uh I'm yeah. an old man, Amy. I'm an old man. You say that you say this was. Um, you mentioned to me before we start recording, though, that um, this is actually quite a uh, special episode for you personally, even though you weren't around. Do tell. It is well, like you said, I remember watching this vividly as well because the very first episode of Nightmare I ever watched, because I watched it on the Challenge reruns, mm -hmm. I believe, was episode five of series one. But this one in particular, I remember really clearly, and I was watching it before. Um. There's kind of like two separate memories for me when it comes to Nightmare. There's like the second memory where it's like, I'm watching it now and just been like, oh yeah, this and this and this. But the first memory is where the memories are very vivid. So I can remember details, but sometimes, you know, like when you're a kid and you watch something and sometimes you remember things wrong. Yeah. Or you remember things differently. All the time, including over Nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But this is the one, for some reason, I would have been about seven or eight when this ran. This is the one I seem to remember consistently like i was watching it before i'm just like oh yeah i remember this part and i remember this part and also it's special because the teens from merseyside which yes, is where i'm from i was gonna mention that <laughs> you've stolen my thunder damn you yes <laughs> <laughs> i knew you'd enjoy that <laughs> carry on <laughs> um but no like um that was basically it like i don't remember there was bits like i don't remember mogdred being there because i can never seem to remember mogdred at all but i remember like Bits like Merlin being there. I know this was the episode before, but I remember the whole Wellway scene with Treyguard or like, you know, Mildred being there. And then I remember the Medusa. Um, but yeah, that's the only episode I seem to remember where all the details are kind of bang on. So yes. I don't know why it's this one specifically, but it must be a reason. So <laughs> As you say, it probably just because it's a team from Merseyside. There weren't, there weren't many yeah, of them. So it's, it's, it's as good a reason as any. I mean, um, they're 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 actually from just outside Liverpool, and so are you. So it's um, it, yeah. it's it, that that makes it even more um, uh, <laughs> more of a validation for you. Um, Absolutely. As you've uh, quietly mentioned, there it's a, it's a very special episode um, in more ways. Um, but we'll come to that um, once we get into it. I think mm -hmm. um, the Hollies were number one in the charts at this point. With he hit it. And the number one movie in the UK was the Phil Collins movie, Buster. Phil Collins, in his motion picture debut as Buster. A small time crook. Keep on hiding. Oh yeah. With big time dreams. What is it? Elizabeth Taylor's jewelry. To roll my own train. One million quid. Uh, I take it you haven't watched Buster either. I didn't know Phil Collins made movies. <laughs> nah, fair. So, but anyway, we've now set the scene um, of 1988, but there's also, we have to set the scene for the episode of Nightmare. So if you're ready, mm -hmm. time turns, the fire burns, time out is gone, this podcast is on. <laughs> Welcome, Watchers. Would you dare the deadliest dungeon of them all? Could you be bold and bright enough to rise to Tregard's challenge? A judge, then, for one such quest is now in progress. How fair the challenges? Well, let's discover. Four Shropshire lasses, glory-bound, were forced to dash when a monster frowned. But though they fooled the talking wall, 
a ghosty trapped them in its thrall. And so the challenge passed in time to Chris and pals from Merseyside. The magic chalice is their quest. These lads are out to do their best. But though a snake can't make them quail, it's getting hot upon the trail. And even I have had a turn. So, will they win or will they learn? Some of the yeah. virtual rhymes that we have in Nightmare are just criminally bad. And <laughs> <laughs> what we have one of the worst I've ever heard in, um, in, in this, this week's Dungeon Ditty, where mm -hmm. Trey Guards dares to try and rhyme time with Merseyside, there have been there have been some awful ones um, throughout the first uh, ten or so, ten or so episodes, but that has to be right down there, really just scraping the barrel, um, just saying Stretch. one say, similar letter will do. That it, that was horrendously bad. Team, I think you can trust that to be the real well this time. Hurry now, for life force is dangerously low! Chris. And level two beckons! We start where we left off last week, uh, with Mildred's hovel. Uh, this is, uh, with Christopher and her and team. As you remember, um, we had the, uh, Mildred was putting, uh, an ingredients in the cauldrons to summon yeah. up a wellway, and uh, then Temporal Disruption hit. It was the very first time Temporal Disruption had, uh, had a bell, so everybody oh. watching it, watching it for the first uh, watching it as new at the time, thought that that meant that the, she was casting a spell to kill Christopher. <laughs> so, so, we were very relieved, uh, um, when this week started and we saw Christopher was still around. Um, yeah. But she uh, cast the spell, and Mildred has changed the cauldron into a real well this time. It was a fake well um, yeah. initially in the previous episode. Traegar gives his usual life force warning, and then the advisors, uh, the advisors guide Chris into the well by all speaking at once, which is always a really helpful bit of guidance, yeah. isn't it, Rhythm, <laughs> here. Right. Right. Walk, walk, walk forward. Walk forward. Right. Turn to your left. Yeah. Just oh, have to. That's, that's it. it. That's fine. Walk, walk forward. forward. Can you walk for turn to your left? Your left. Now Can walk forward. Can you feel the well? well? Yeah. Right, now climb, 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 climb into, into it. it. One, up Quick. steps. And another. And another. And into it. Into, into, it. It. into it. Into it. Come on, clever clogs. Into Down. it. You go. No, that's <laughs> actually interesting because, like, I found watching this that this is one of the better teams in terms of like directions. They are, yeah. Which, yeah. yeah so I'm guessing it's like the sort of first level panic because I normally find. Um, a lot with winning teams as well, they're a bit clumsy during like the first level, but yes, once they, they get to level two, they get their bearings. It's, it's, it's once they get into their stride, literally in the Dungeoneer's case, but yeah, it's, um, yeah. They, they, there are times, even when they're in level three, this lot have to start getting a little overexcited and they all start shouting instructions at once, but we have, I mean, not to any as, <laughs> as me and the other Martin have, have, have discussed in some detail, there are far worse ones for that than this, than this particular crew. <laughs> God, speaking um, of um, speaking of temporal <clears throat> disruption, though, I have a little story about that. Go ahead. Because I remember very clearly in the first series where, like, Trigor would be like, you know, temporal disruption's imminent, and then the fire would freeze. But it's ingrained in my head where he'd say, like, you know, will this team do this and that, or will the dungeon win again? And I don't know whether that was specific to season one or not, but I genuinely thought that that's what he said at the end of every single quest. So when I was rewatching some series it's, two episodes, I was just like, well, where's he saying it? Yeah, He's it's, not it's, saying it. It was, it was, um, it was pretty much, it, it's very easy to get that impression from season one because it was pretty much the way all but one episode ended in season one. They just kept on playing the same recording at the end of every episode in season <laughs> one and had everybody going with their forehead against the desk and say, will you, will you say something different, please? Um, <laughs> and the beginning of each episode, except for the first one, um, also was the same recording over and over and over. So it was very maddening. Um, it mm. was not. It was not great TV having that having that same sequence used over and over. Um, no, I think Tim Charles realised fairly quickly while watching it, um, watching it back uh, week after week on on the television. Maybe we should stop doing that and and, yeah. and come up with one for each episode. So uh, season two is a lot better in that regard. Certainly, yeah. it's a lot better in <laughs> yeah, most regards. If we're being if we're being quite honest with ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, should mention, um, before we get into the guts of the episode, this is actually possibly the fastest episode of the early years. Um, Chris and their team, and Chris and team really find their strides um, almost straight away when and they get into level yeah. two, and they just shoot through um, chamber after chamber um, at a, yeah. a pace Linford Christie would have been proud of. It was, just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, I, I almost wondered whether um, the production crew were having trouble keeping up with them, and getting yeah. the next rooms ready. I wasn't sure about that, but I was thinking before because I was watching this. It starts level two. And by the end of the episode, they're almost at the end of level three. So I was just like, Jesus mm. Christ, calm down a bit. Anyone born in Merseyside is just born with the natural gift of speed, so. Um, beware double meanings when you use the word speed, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I spend a lot of time on Merseyside, actually, you know, li living in Manchester. Yeah. And so it's... Uh, it's, it's it's very nearby. So they become the second, Chris becomes the second Dungeoneer to reach level two. How's about that? It's raining, Dungeoneers. Oh, oh, master, save me. No, don't be foolish, Folly. You should know better than to sit under a well, way. Well, I do now. Chris ends up in the usual level two starting chamber, the uh, the monk's cavern, as it's sometimes called. Uh, it doesn't have uh, Cedric in it for some reason, uh, but uh, Folly makes his return after two and a half quests. Folly was actually my first like big introduction to Nightmare because, like I said, I my first episode was season one, episode five, where he did that like mm -hmm. the right hand to the left hand riddle yes so my first experience was literally him doing that riddle and then the team running into a bomb room <laughs> now that is a hell of a hook it has to be said that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, start, you start with you start with something really surreal and meta and the very next thing that happens kaboom that is going to, <laughs> that is going to draw in a lot of kids it has to be said that it has to be said Polly is uh going to ask them a riddle that, in truth, could have any answer you like and wouldn't necessarily be wrong. Now listen carefully, Christopher. Fleshy Jack was quick to act, but thought about it later. While Stodgy Sid just thought and thought, but action did not save her. Steady John said, Steady on, I'll think while I have time. But when time's run out, it's best to act before I'm in the slime. <laughs> now tell me, Christopher, and don't delay, except of course for thought. Are you like John, or Jack, or Sid? Choose right and gain reward. I was gonna say, I was listening to it before and I just, I wasn't really following it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, he's asking you, to, um, he's describing three different people one of which is too slow to act, one of which is too quick to act, and the other one which is just gets it just right, and which one are you? Um, now, the problem for me uh, with this riddle is that the right answer is also a, an empty boast, because the reality is you don't know, it, it, you don't know for sure that you're going to, to give it the right amount of time. They say John, steady John, um, and so, because they're boasting, uh, Folly gives them a reward. You've got to be cautious to use magic, but not too cautious. Now I know you can use it, I'm going to gift you some. The spell is called... Web. Yeah. This scene, actually, is another scene I remember very specifically, because Folly, the way he grants the spell, he kind of, like, puts his arms up in the end as, like, an arch thing like that. Yeah. So, I don't know why I remember that specifically, but he, I think he says, like, the spell is web, but in my mind, from when I remember watching it, I remember him going, like, this is the web spell, <laughs> which is a bit more dramatic. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah, I, I always notice that gesture, and I think... Why get excited about a spider's web? <laughs> it's <laughs> folly. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's you know it is this really really grand gesture with his arms. Um, he sort of bends down low and bows mm. and then stands up straight to it dramatically and hurls his arms around. 
I'm just thinking, you look like you're drowning while trying to do the butterfly stroke. Just give them the spell and, and knob off or something, will you? <laughs> and he does, to be fair to him, once he's given them the spell, he does knob off, and uh, his, ir- his laughter is ir- even more irritating and unforced mm-hmm. than usual. But it is an important moment. They get a very, very useful spell. Oh, by the way, have you noticed at the beginning of the scene, um, somebody seems to have moved the wellway um, further back in the chamber yeah. because instead of them landing near the bottom r- right corner of the cavern they land almost on top of folly on who's sitting the on the, yeah. <laughs> sitting on cedric's chair hill well not chair i'm not sure what it is an ottoman or something like boxing yeah a box a box that will do one thing i should mention when folly gives them the food um and he says to christopher don't put any weight on any more weight on for goodness sake do you think that might have been a bit cruel to any um to, to any watchers who were um have body dysmorphia issues or anything oh my god <laughs> i don't know i just I, I, i'm always i'm always looking at things that they did back in on tv back in the 1980s and thinking yeah they wouldn't do they wouldn't do that now we get a lot oh. of those ones when we're doing these podcasts i was listening to some of like the old um not the audio plays from Dunzel plays, but like the other ones from like Ross and all them. Yeah, just a quick plug for everybody to make clear. That's the Nightmare Adventures um, audio series. Yeah. Um, it's another bunch of audio plays um, uh, parodying the gameplay from Nightmare rather than just mm-hmm. storylines Story. with the characters in it. Yeah, nightmareaudioseries.webs.com. There you go, Ross Thompson. Don't say I don't do anything for you. And you, Jay <laughs> Collins. We very, we very kindly plugged yours. Very kindly plugged your place there. So anyway. plug ours. <laughs> anyway, they uh, have the web spell. Folly makes an irritating laughing noise, and then he buggers off. And uh, <laughs> therefore, Chris buggers off through the only available exit, and he yep. enters the Mills of Doom. <laughs> These are the mills of doom. Beware the darkness below. The center of each cog is safe, but Christopher must risk the teeth to exit. Guide him with care, but hurry. It's actually the very first view of the mills of doom. They didn't appear in season one. Really? Um, really, yeah, they, they weren't in there. Um, There's like a lot of firsts for this episode. Yeah, it's um, the nightmare. Se- season two is not as similar to season one as you might think. There's, there's a lot yeah. of uh, there's more changes between the two seasons than you might realize. So, a really, really geeky one that I notice, um, a, a few other people notice it as well. Um, when they're moving between chambers, um, in season one, the chamber will just go straight backwards. Um, into a red void from the front of the screen. In season yeah. two, it sort of swings downwards and backwards away from the front yeah. of the screen. Only a pure nerd would notice that, but I noticed it. <laughs> Very first episode of season two when I watched it, I noticed it straight away. That's moving differently from last year. <laughs> I don't know what that. I don't know what that says about me. Um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm. I'm telling myself I deserve praise for it. Just remember the little details. Yeah, that is an incredibly little detail. It's a, a rather menacing name, but it is really just another timing puzzle. Um, it's just, it yeah. just come up with a slightly different form for it. It is an early form of CGI graphics, believe it or not, rather than just hand drawings. Um, the, yeah. the, there's things moving in the background that are hand drawings, but uh, the actual mills themselves are CGI. Um, and gives you a sort of a, a, a foretaste of what some of the stuff that would come along in, uh, especially in seasons uh, six to eight, a lot, a lot more, oh, yeah. a lot more computer generated stuff. It was really well done, like regardless of the time. Oh yeah, it's, it's 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 excellent. Work. One of the problems I noticed with it um, is that the, as it keeps on repeating the same cycle, if you watch um, some of the clockwork in the background that doesn't have anything to do with the cogs themselves you notice it starts to slow down because I think uh, because the computers at the time were so limited, um, mm. after a few cycles of the same animation, the computer itself was actually slowing down. The, the, um, the process was getting over the, <laughs> overheated by it. So, um, oh, no. <laughs> so, so at, that, at that point, the puzzle actually slows down as well. Um, <laughs> So it does become it becomes easier to do correctly, but at the same time, it also requires a lot more patience because the mm. cogs, the, the cog teeth are moving slower and slower. So you have oh, to wait longer and longer crazy. to get around. Because of the CGI, um, because it's CGI, 
the Dungeoneer, when they're stood on a cog, doesn't turn with it. On the Spin Dizzy, which you see in um, seasons three and four, yeah. um, they're actually stood on a circle, and it, and when it rotates, they rotate on top of it because it's physically yeah. physically turning. <laughs> the excuse you got here is the centre of the cogs are actually standing still. The teeth are on a groove um, on the outside edges, and so only they are going round and round. So, yeah. uh, so uh, that's the excuse. It doesn't quite explain how when a dungeoneer actually steps onto the teeth, it doesn't he doesn't start getting carried with it. But they spent a little time stood on that bit that we'll we'll it's let it go. <laughs> yeah, I love this room for this episode only because um they obviously keep giving him directions from like their view so when it's like sidestep to your right like they're looking at like his yes. left as well. <laughs> yes as as as, uh, as mr h has uh, as mentioned in one of the notes he's given me um advisor kenneth gives some of the most unhelpful directions i've ever <laughs> heard here so, he gives, <laughs> I can't so argue with my that. favorite my favorite part was like um they were lining him up to go and then obviously because they told him to go the wrong way he sidesteps to his left and then one just goes oh no he's gone the wrong way oh no he's gone the wrong way <laughs> <laughs> yeah so also, do, you, do you notice watching closely that christopher gets away with a late step from cog one to cog two um no no if you watch closely you actually see that the two cogs have come apart again direct beneath his feet and um he should have yeah. fallen through there if they he might have got away with it simply because they wouldn't have had a good animation uh, uh yeah <laughs> yes for, for people falling uh so, to death. <laughs> uh, um also one rather interesting detail or semi-interesting detail i think it's slightly interesting um the sound effect you get from the mill in the background of the mills and doom of the um of the mechanisms moving mm. ar around around that was recycled um in seasons five and six for the descenders yeah. um oh, which yeah. uh, traveled between levels um the wellways are what we use to travel between levels in the first two seasons but they came up with more and more different methods starting in season three Maybe um and the descender the which is basically just a fancy name for a lift uh was introduced yeah. in season five and were you actually use on and off right up until the end of the series that would so, be interesting if it turns yeah. out like the mills were used to like power the descender in later seasons <laughs> were, were the mills of doom powered with techno sorcery yeah it's a yeah <laughs> it's actually it's actually a question we've explored a bit um in mm. the in the audio plays so yeah there is there is a little bit of techno sorcery um before lord fear arrived yeah. um, this is this is an example and mog was like surprise <laughs> <laughs> What am I? You were in a, like a hallway, like a bit like a cavern. You were on a bridge, don't move. Underneath the bridge, they're like all worms, like that was on the <coughs> Hurry, team, for this is the Vale of Worms. One false step here, and Christopher will be feeding them. Mr. Hardy, your spelling is atrocious. I've just uh, checked the notes you forwarded to me, and you spelt veil like the sort of thing people or women wear over their faces. <laughs> No, it's V A L E, Mr. H, not V E I L. I have been editing for so long. So, so long. About the spelling. Do I look like I give a f? Veil covered in worms. <laughs> oh, yeah, can you imagine that? A veil of worms. Ah! Awful! <laughs> What a horrible thing to do to a woman! God <laughs> I almighty. present to you the bride. <laughs> oh, but they could have done without this scene because it's just like all they do is walk straight. Yeah, and that's it. it. Is, <laughs> there, there, there are better things that are done with it in later episodes. It's, yeah. um, it, it does rather just get in the way of this scene a little bit. Come on, I will go. What am I? You're in a smallish room with two doors in front of you. One, one is both of them are blank, but in front of one there is what looks like a guard, and he's carrying oh! a stack. Stay where you are, vacant features! They emerge in the axe room, and it's guarded by Cedric, for some reason. <laughs> yes, it's funny that, isn't it? <laughs> Why, why was Folly guarding um, the monk's chamber, and Cedric suddenly been transferred here? And 
And whilst we're on that subject, where the hell is Gumboil, the lazy git? Why isn't he guarding this chamber? He's Sorry. Somewhere. Yeah. Oh, of course, silly me. That's why the monk had to retreat there and, and Folly had to nip down the wellway to, keep, to cover for him. So, yeah, he demands a password. Team doesn't have a password, so they need to cast a spell. And it's accompanied by some spirited Skyrim NPC acting because he has to stand around in silence for a bit, waiting for them to like actually do the spell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is something we've, we, um, a phenomenon we've encountered before, and, and it's. Um, um, it's also something that you get in the film Existence, where they actually ha where they actually yeah. it, where they actually um, describe it as NPC. Um, <laughs> when you're playing a computer game like this, um, the computer is always waiting for you to do a certain action before yeah. the, before I let the story carry on. And whilst that's happening, the characters, the non-player characters, are always sitting there just repeating the same action over and over and over yeah. and over, and it starts looking embarrassingly unnatural. Spellcasting. Spellcasting. Go on. The w. Password, come on! D e. B. What? What? Walk forward, Chris. I've, I've always liked that scene. I, I don't know why, but I've, I've always rather enjoyed. I've, I've always rather enjoyed seeing uh, seeing him getting caught up in the web. Um, <laughs> it's, it doesn't. It, it, the web doesn't convince me nearly as much now as it did 32 years ago. I should no. stress. Um, it's. Uh, it is very clearly just uh, white light lines, but uh, yeah. it's. It's. It was good enough for me as a kid, I suppose. This is an interesting point that Mr. H makes. Um, he says he was quite sad to see this happen to Cedric. It seemed much more like a gum oil thing to him. Yeah. I don't agree with that. And the no, reason yeah. why and the reason why is I don't want Cedric to keep on doing the same thing every time he appears. And uh, I'm I'm quite happy for him to get something different to do. If he, if he, yeah. if he, if he's always sat in the monk's chamber and he's always asking free riddles um, of the dungeon here, <laughs> it must have it would have got very very boring for Lawrence Werber and um yeah and, and it would have restricted the character. The, the character has developed quite a bit by this point because they've done mm. other things with him. Um and yeah, give him a gumboil moment. Why not? Is this any worse than what happened to Folly? What happened to him when he had the duel of insults against Folly? For God's sake, yeah, <laughs> that that was really, really undignified. Getting insulted God. half to death. If well, that's what's going to happen to you, get get maybe that's wrapped why up he's in a in... web. Yeah, maybe that's why that's he's in this room instead of like the monk room because Folly just came in and he's just like, oh, f this, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, perfect. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> There will be um, a goblin horn sound over the bit where you said f there. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, we don't, because we don't fucking like fuckers saying fuck on this fucking podcast. You fucking understand me? <laughs> there will be so many uses of the goblin horn on this particular podcast. <laughs> kill you <laughs> christ all right so they go to the level two clue room afterwards Batman! what am i you're in a small room in in front of you there's a flight of stairs you, there are two exits in the room you've just come in you've just come in through one and there's I, a door down the stairs on your right walk sad, down the no, stairs no, no, no. sad step to your right and again now can you see the banister yeah or feeling your way down the stairs. So, so yes, the level two clue room. room. At last, here is the hauntingly beautiful level two clue room. Yeah, we get, we're just um, uh, we're just we, we tend to we tend to um get a little bit uh, caught up in level two clue room. We love it. We really do. We, we think we think oh, yeah. it's we think it's a we think it's the best place in the history of nightmare for haunting, and we do get some hauntings. Now, must specify this is the real reason why this is a special episode not just for amy but for nightmare as a whole mm -hmm. it's the haunting that appears in a moment's time we'll come to it in just a second but this is the big moment on the table we've got a small spade that they call it a spoon for some reason so <laughs> So do you when on Mersey's side? Do you, do you when you're digging in the garden? Do you say, "Someone get me a spoon, will you?" Like, I got this. <laughs> God, that. Why have you given me a out. shovel? It's useless. <laughs> get me a spoon from the cutlery drawer, you idiots! Come oh, on. It, looks, <laughs> it does. To my credit, it does look like a weird shovel. Like it, it's it circular, is, yeah. not square. Yeah. So. <laughs> it is. It is. You're quite right. Scooper. <laughs> because they, they obviously couldn't, couldn't be bothered going to B and Q. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they just. Uh, they just. Put to some, put something together using clay or something. Yeah. I, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, they call it a spoon, um, a charm, and a key. Oh, yeah. bless this episode more than any other. That the key doesn't talk <laughs> when they pick it up. 
No, Casper. You oh, don't like Casper. <laughs> oh, is this heaven, I ask? It probably is. Yes, there is no Casper in season two until the last couple of episodes. What's wrong with Casper? I am going to give you the benefits of the doubt <laughs> and spare your life for saying that. But I will only, <laughs> I will only spare it this once. Uh, All right, thank you. <laughs> there's also half a grapefruit, uh, which the team seem to think is a broken eggshell. <laughs> Why they think they're going to get much nutrition out of a broken eggshell, I really don't know. Uh, eh, but, uh, they still, they still recognise it as a food item. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also uh, nice of one of the advisors to think of making use of the banister rather than forcing a yeah. person without a person who's blindfolded to try and walk down the stairs Do you think um, in the middle. Any of the dungeoneers ever like fell down the stairs? <laughs> I am certain at least one did. Um, there's there's <laughs> there's one um in season one um who really really s- treads extremely heavily as they're going down the stairs. Um, yeah. And I've come to think I didn't mention it at the time, but because I, um, I didn't think so, but I now come to think that, that was actually a retake, and he was treading so heavily to make sure that he didn't have a repetition. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, oh, it's, no. I, 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 I think they did. I think they did. The eggshell goes into the knapsack, whereupon yeah. uh, one of them realizes actually it's a grapefruit, and then comes one of the big moments um, in the early years of Nightmare. Examine the big spoon, Chris. We'll see if there's any. <laughs> my, my. One of the bold ones is with us, I see. One of the bold yet brainless ones. Quail intruder. Look upon Mogred and quail. This is only my image. Continue on this path and you will meet me in person. (laughs) That will be interesting now, won't it? You must understand, team, that no true quest is unopposed. It is in the nature of evil to struggle against truth and justice. Remember, fear lives stronger in the threat than in any deed. <laughs> I love the time I get that scene where they're just like, okay, so can you examine the spoon? And then he starts laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it was well timed, that, wasn't it? <laughs> And when he says afterwards that he's one of the bold but brainless ones, it's just, again, it sort of seems a perfect <laughs> response to somebody it's looking at a spade and saying, is that a spoon? Uh, spoon. Mind you, <laughs> the, the size Mogdred appears at later, it, he could have used it as one. This is the moment we've been waiting for for quite some time because it was supposed to happen in season one, but no Dungeoneer survived long enough. It's the first appearance Easy. of Merlin's evil half. Mogdred himself. Mogdred. It's only a projection of him, okay? But that's still more than we've had so far. The, uh, up until this point, the only t- role he's played is when Merlin has given warnings that Mogdred lies ahead in the dungeon. That's so therefore, I think maybe this is the reason why he's in season two, he's in level two <laughs> in this season. <laughs> it's, simply, <laughs> it's simply to give him an outing. <laughs> so, it's come out eventually. <laughs> all those lines that John would not learned in the first season, he never got around to speaking. He's at last... <laughs> The last we can actually get him to to deliver some. Notice oh. that Merlin doesn't appear in level two in this at all. Yeah. There's no Hall of Folly. Um, instead, Mogdred is the uh, is the big feature in in the in the second half yeah. of level two. This is weird to me because from what I remember, because obviously I know Mogdred now, but from what I remember watching it, I definitely remember Merlin because uh, I remember him showing up in this episode. But I just cannot remember Mogdred at all. But I don't know why. I just cannot remember him. <laughs> Merlin makes an appearance in level three in this episode, but he doesn't yeah. appear in he doesn't appear in level two. Um, it's, it's interesting you don't remember Mogdred, but I do think at the same time that says something about Mogdred in the cold light of day. The way John Woodnut mm. plays him is brilliant. It is absolutely <laughs> terrifying. His oh, the way yeah. he, his booming laugh is perfect. Yeah, this is what I love so much about the casting of this show is that. Um, 
knowing that a lot of the um, actors played like multiple characters and John Woodnot did amazing. Like when you do a thing where it's like you can play a good half and a bad half of a character, but still make it believable to the audience that they're two separate people. That is insane. Like it, massive respect for that. It takes a lot of doing. It certainly does. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, as actual a written character in the cold light of day, Mog's Red really is boring as f- <laughs> <laughs> his dialogue is so trite in the cold, cold light. If you see it yeah. written down, I mean, um, I wrote um, the script for an audio play 10 years ago called When Five Tribes Go to War and Mogjad was one of the central characters in it. I quite like writing most of the scripts, but all the scenes yeah. Mogjad was in, oh God, it was just, it was it was boring just to write them because his dialogue yeah. is so corny <laughs> it is only when a, a, an actor yeah. like john woodnut can deliver dialogue like that in a way that makes you not notice how corny he, he actually the character actually is oh absolutely like i can't remember who played mog dread for that really amy really but he pulled off really well in the audio play as well um, it was Martin Harder who played him in the yeah. In the movie. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's, um, I, he, just... I thought he did pretty well actually. It's not it's not oh. easy to do well with a character yeah. whose dialogue is so awful. You know, God. there was there, there were there was nearly a couple of early drafts um, of the script where I tried to sort of crowbar in some s- slightly humoured lines um, for him. Um, yeah. But I read them back to myself. I thought, no, no, this just this, it's just not him. Yeah. So I had to force myself to take the bits yeah. out and just and just and just write it in a really, uh, it really stayed form again because that's yeah. that's the way. And it and it was so frustrating. But that's the way he is. Um, and so yeah. I was. I felt really sorry for Mr. H when when, <laughs> when when I gave him the part. And said, do you want to do this? Yeah. Do you really want to no. do this? <laughs> It worked in the end because like I was listening to like all the audio plays back like a few weeks ago mm-hmm. and one of my favorite lines he did which always makes me laugh is when like Gumboil comes back after getting like the fake note and Mog just like what the blazes are you doing back on level three? <laughs> like he just pulled that off. So it's it's well. excellent delivery. It's it was excellent delivery from Mr. H. I I, I, I take my hat <laughs> off to him for that. That's to say, I, I, it's <laughs> It's only through sheer force that you can make anything yeah. out of Mogdred, and, that, and that's the problem. <laughs> um, but uh, that's how John Woodnot did it as well. It's, it's mm. just through sheer force. It's just through sheer exuberant delivery that you get anything out of it. Because, if, as I say, if you just uh, look at the um, the dialogue from the script, uh, if you look at the script of, of Five Tribes, for instance, and you, re- and you pick yeah. out Mogdred's lines in it, and you look at reading them in the cold light of day, you go, Ugh, she, yuck. Oh, God. What part of 1915 did you get this lines from? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's horrible to do. It really is. I just wanted to cut in. Um, I just say I didn't really have a problem with the lines because they were uh, they were very mock dread. <laughs> it's the best way of putting it. So I never really questioned it. Uh, so uh, hats off to John Woodnut. Hats off to Martin Harder <laughs> for both being very, rem- doing a remarkably good job of performing mog dread because uh, i wouldn't want to try because I, I would really no. struggle i would really struggle with them so anyway uh we get our first appearance and uh i must admit first time i saw uh, i saw that scene i was genuinely terrified but it is all about actually scaring you rather than being a yeah. genuine threat and that's another of the um weaknesses of mog dread he isn't much of a threat a lot of the time uh, no. he doesn't he doesn't actually do do that much damage he just he just scares people until season four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he does actually kill someone in season four. That's true. Yeah. That's, uh... well, technically, he gets one in this season as well, but he doesn't do anything. He just laughs at them. Mm, it's, a, it, it's 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 like the, it's like a lock in in the crystal maze. That one. It's not. Yeah. He doesn't. He's not really doing. He doesn't really have to do anything. He just sits there and lets the life clock mm. run out. So. Yeah. So then mm. he disappears, and then they look on the table, and then there's the charm. Have a look at the charm. Have a look at the charm. Emergency, emergency, critical life force train, you are carrying a destructor. Chop it, chop it, put it down. Just in time. And this is the one reason why I can't stand Trey God in these first earlier seasons. Because he knows what that charm does. And he's just like, not in this episode, but I know he doesn't know. He's like, oh, come on, pick it up, pick it up, you can do it. Pick it up. Oh, no, it's evil! Put it down! <laughs> 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 
first things first, just to say that's one of the reasons why I love Trey Guard in the first couple <laughs> of seasons. <laughs> <laughs> I find his moral ambiguity in the first couple of seasons so oh, much yeah. more, so much more entertaining than the Obi Wan Kenobi he turns into oh, later. Um, he's just having a good time. <laughs> yeah. But also, I have to say, um, he doesn't actually do that in that partic- in this particular scene. He just yeah. he just says investigate the objects in general. In fact, he does keep badgering a later dungeoneer to investigate something which yeah. does um it was it was julian i think uh in, the, yeah. the t- in team 10 but i think he does that too um and then sort of sort of blames them and also he does it right at the end of season three so anyway the charm proves to be a destructor um which drains half their life force in a few seconds so Trey guards gets them to put it down again um so, and they decide all right maybe we shouldn't take that but then yeah. just to irritate everybody there's only two objects left now. There's the key and the spoon. Spoon. And they then sit there trying to debate whether to take them. Ugh. You're allowed to carry two objects, and there's only two objects that you know are, <laughs> are safe to carry. So, uh, well, I would have loved if they were just like, well, maybe we need the talisman. Why don't we put it in the spoon, and then we're not holding it? <laughs> That's actually an interesting idea because they could then give the talisman to Mogdred later. But, oh well, <laughs> oh well, they didn't have you on the team. They didn't think of that, did they? No. <laughs> <laughs> but there you are. Yeah. So um, they are they are getting into their stride in terms of manoeuvring, but they're still having the odd moment where you think, oh, for heaven's sake, don't be so stupid. Yeah. Just pick up the two other objects and get out of the room, <laughs> which eventually they do. What am I? You're in a small room. In front of you, there is a man, and he's playing with something on fire. Oi! You! Where do you think you're going with that spade, then? Who said you could come in here? Eh? Well, I don't care what you say or who you are. You can't come onto an authorised site without a card. That you can't against the rules of the guild, that is. Of course it is. Our first view of the mine is also the first meeting of with um a satirical character a uh, mm-hmm. rather topical character his name's bumptious bumptious is a dwarf miner although he he may not. <laughs> he may not appear very dwarf like i sound like olaf well, he may not try to be very dwarf like you know what i mean <laughs> He's a stickler for the mining and rules. <laughs> you can tell I spend a lot of time in Liverpool, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so this guy, um, he's a stickler for the mining guild rules. And then Chris has a spoon, which he was supposed to take. And then he's just like, oh, how dare you have that spoon without a card? But beggars can't be choosers, I guess. <laughs> You've got to remember, this was only a couple of years after the miners' strike. Um, really? Which was, a, yeah, it was, uh, well, I think it was three to four years, so it was maybe a, a, a little bit longer than I'm, I'm remembering. Yeah. But, but it was, it, it was only, uh, only slightly afterwards. And if you actually study the way Bumptious behaves, you realise he's a parody of Arthur Scargill. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah, so he's, he, he's, it, it's, it's sort of a bit on the late side, but sort of topical for the time. Um, and uh, Bumptious is uh, he's a bit bureaucratic. He's got a whiny northern accent, so sort of sort of uh, <laughs> central northern rather than rather than Merseyside. Uh, but uh, uh, he's he's ba- he's there to uh, um, to sort of say this was the this was the sort of guy who was leading the miners. Is it any wonder they lost? <laughs> 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 it's a sh- it, it's a shame they lost. I was very definitely on the miners' side, but. Uh, Maybe if they'd had a better leader, things could have ha- could have worked out a bit better. I think is is the point that uh, Bumptious yeah. is meant is is conveying. But, uh, I'm Fair a lefty. Enough. I'm a, I'm a lefty, so I, sh- I shouldn't be politicising these things, but I'm going to anyway because <laughs> I rock. <laughs> so he explains in this that his apprentice has gone home sick, which leads me to think, who's his apprentice? Uh, that is actually a question I've never really dwelt on. I, I, I must admit that. I, I, it would be rather interesting to know now you mention it. Yeah. Um, maybe Gretel. I mean, you see... You yeah, see, I was Gre- thinking that. Gretel actually appears um, in, a, in a later scene with him. It's, 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 just having a little bit of mining. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, can you can you imagine um, the miners' strikes happening with Gretel leading them? <laughs> what do we want? 
tea and <laughs> and and toad flavored pie. When do we want it? Oh well, well um, I'm I'm having trouble mixing it because of the um, because the toads are really <laughs> bad, really difficult to mash, you know. Um, but I'll get them oh, to you no. soon. It would, so, it would it would have been a, it would have been a much better a, a much less violent minor strike I suppose yeah but, so, but um, peace and tranquility I, I think Thatcher would have won a lot more quickly um, it took a whole year the real minor strike <laughs> I think I think we're, we're Gretel leading them it would have been over <laughs> it was at this point that Martin knocked his microphone out of the socket because Amy was too polite to say anything. Martin continued talking for three straight weeks before he realized. But that's the kind of thing you come to expect when you record a podcast with Martin O'Doney. All right, perfect. Right, so yeah, bumptious. <laughs> just, just restoring my expression to the one it was when we finished recording a moment ago. So, so anyway, we've got bumptious. He's an Arthur Scargill impersonation. As we, were, as we were saying, he was a parody of Arthur Scargill. Yeah. Um, I do have issues with this scene, and it's another one of those things where I think they wouldn't allow it today. Because yeah. what they're basically saying is a miner who has a job which involves explosives mm -hmm. thinks that because his assistant hasn't, his apprentice hasn't shown up for that day, I know, I'll take a random passerby who is clearly well under 16 years of age and ask him <laughs> if he'll help me blow something up. Oh, no. <laughs> I think that's a really good thing to, for children's television to encourage, don't you? I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> oh, my. What a brilliant idea. And it gets worse as the scene continues. Raise your right hand. Raise it. Come on, raise it. No, just raise it like that. That's it. <coughs> Under Rule 46B, Category C, Stroke 2, Paragraph B, I hereby propose you for temporary membership of HOGG Hug. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. All those against? Nobody against. Motion carried. Right, put your hand down. Come and stand by this plunger here. That's it. Can you see it? Yeah. Right. Put your hand on it, but don't press it down, whatever you do, until I say so. I'm going over to the other side of the pit, and when I say now, you push it down hard. Got it? Yeah. Good. This uh, actual room, or, or, or cave, let's be honest, it's not a room, is a very important one because in season three it was converted into the minecart ride, or the entrance yeah. to the minecart ride, So, which was the first time um, form that uh, moving between level um, didn't involve a wellway or at least a trapdoor. So it was uh, a very. It was uh, the first. It, it was the new entrance to level three. So it was. It wasn't too major here, except as bumptious as sort of home away from home. Um, but it did become very important in the third season. It's uh, yeah. There seems to be a general consensus amongst Nightmare fans that the minecart ride was by far the best and most spectacular <laughs> method of travel between levels. Yeah. <laughs> Heading back to the light issue of uh, telling children to use explosives. Do you notice the way that Bumptious puts Christopher directly in front of the wall that's to be blown up, makes him operate yeah. the plunger, and then Bumptious walks away to the other, to, way out of, <laughs> out of the blast zone <laughs> and, <laughs> and makes Christopher blow the wall up when he's standing right in front of it? Over to you. Because what I love about that is that, like, you're making all the points where I'm just like, oh, was it really that bad? Maybe you're just overreacting and then you're just calling it as it is. <laughs> so, yeah, he, um, he, t he performs this rather elaborate ritual um, to make Christopher uh, a temporary member of the guild. Are you standing by? Listen to him, Chris. Yeah. No! <laughs> <laughs> messy, messy. <laughs> See, you can't get the right powder these days. Christopher blows up the wall that he's standing directly in front of. Not a single bit of debris gets anywhere near him. Um, it does 
So there is just some element justice because Bumptious is coughing uncontrollably as the from a dust cloud that has somehow just bypassed the dungeoneer completely, and then it all homed in on Bumptious. So uh, justice is done, uh, but uh, there's now a nice big hole in the wall that uh, he, for Christopher to walk through to get into the next chamber. Yeah. <laughs> Where am I? You're in a big room with four doors. Three of the doors have got portcullises blocking them. One of the doors has got a lock on. In front of you, directly beneath you... Hurry, team. Bones. I sense that something is coming. Chris, I step left. And walk forward. <laughs> quick, 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 quick. <laughs> quick, quick, keep walking. To your light. It's a simple lock door chamber with the added threat of Mugger making his presence known. The team get through pretty quickly. Yeah, there's not really um, much to mention. This is this is actually mainly up to this point. This this room has mainly been used as a catacomb by chamber. Um, yeah. Usually, usually coloured a yellowy orange rather than a bluish haze here. Um, but it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, it, without Mogdred's laughter, the, um, the any element of danger would probably be almost imperceptible. To be honest, uh, oh, the boat, the boat, bones on boat. The floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 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 um, probably uh, probably the bones of uh, Richard from uh, season one. Uh, <laughs> Legit, right? I actually right. had an idea for this where. <laughs> Because like there was a part in slight spoiler for season three, but there's a part in season three where you find the remains of what was supposedly a dungeoneer because it's like all bones and then one of the helmets, which in the, led it, me to the theory. in the fire cavern, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. led me to the theory that like even though the dungeoneers, you know, quote unquote, die, but oh, it's fine, it's an illusion, they're safe. I feel like they'd go back, but then like a remnant of them, like a copy of their body would be left there. So I was originally, I was going to plan this whole story, which I never ended up writing when I was younger. It was after the Geek Week episode. All right. Where <laughs> it's kind of like describing sort of like the remains of like all the Dungeoneers and how they died. And then Stuart would fall down and be like, oh, there's a new one. It's been a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Towards Go on, keep going. Higher. Sir. Go on. Where am I? You're in a small hallway. Down one side of the hallway, there is a very deep drop, so <laughs> just stand right there. <laughs> hello again, my bold puppet. And hello to you, my brave puppeteer. Would you like to see how Mordred pulls the strings? Beware, sorcery team! <laughs> Exit fast or your quest ends now! Walk forward fast! We're actually very close to the end of level two now. I um, mean, we only just entered it a minute ago. Um, this is a, a familiar scene. Um, it's been used uh, for the, as a giant's chamber. It's been used as the troll's chamber. Yeah. But it's just a, it's just a basic cavern ledge. Um, but we've got a new... Uh, figure standing off the side of it or sitting off the side of it the cavern ledge at the you moment see. has Mogdred appearing supersized over the edge of it yeah so, don't mind me i'm just on my throne you take away the laughter um and the wiggling of fingers that he's doing here as he says he's pulling the string pull the string it's, it's objectively very yeah. very silly looking uh, but the, the, the sheer conviction with, with which Woodnut and, and Hugo Meyer are performing the scene is so strong. It's, it's so much um, belief in it. It convinces you to be scared anyway. But in the end, all Chris really has to do is just walk in a reasonably straight line to the exit. What am I? You're in a small room. In one corner of the room there is a well with something on it. I can't really see from here. Could you walk across to the well, please? There. And they find they're in the wellway room already. I've timed this. They've raced through level two in about 12 minutes. So when I say this is a fast-paced episode, I mean it is a fast-paced episode. So, There's something here that is essential to your quest, perhaps. Uh, but have you time to collect yeah. it? Sidestep, yeah. sidestep to your right. No, get the no. food first. Go up, on, go up onto the steps. <laughs> turn to your back. Now, quickly, what? Turn to your right. Just a little turn that. Forward, quick, forward, quick left. Right, sidestep to your left. And again. Yeah. Can you see the, reach up with your left. Yeah. That's it. Turn That's right. Sense. Turn right round. Turn right round. Put your hand down. Go on. And turn again. Right turn again. Turn again. Right forward. Forward. 
we hear the ominous laughter of Mogdred again. There's food on the well, and part of a chalice, a part of the chalice symbol is in the top right corner. That's one of the quest pieces. Then Christopher needs to collect it. Christopher yeah. gets the food, then heads away from the well to collect the chess piece. And while he's doing that, the enlarged hand of Mogdred reaches into the chamber. And this actually, this scene actually is scary. Um, it's one of those things where it's it's a recording. Uh, it, it was at the time. To, you, you, mm. Again, you, you remember um, in context, this, the yeah. scene was scary. Um, you realise now that it was almost certainly um, a bit of re a recorded um, bit of the hand. So it, the hand wasn't going to sort of go after Christopher. Um, but you didn't realise that when you were a kid. <laughs> the problem with this scene is something that really distracts, distract, yeah, distracts me. I remember watching this like when I was finding them on YouTube again for the first time. And when he touches the chalice, I know now it was probably like a glitch or whatever. But it looks like there's something in the back of the room that yeah, forms. Like, something seems spot. to materialise directly behind him when the, ch yeah. when the chalice piece disappears. So like, when he runs back, I'm just like, no, 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 but what if that was something important? But now I realise it was probably just like part of the floor just clipped back in or something. Yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's hard to say. It's hard to say what it is. It's glowing. Yeah. is part of the problem. So it does look like it might, it might be something important. Up the well. Up the steps to the well. <laughs> Get in and down. Get in the well. Quick and down. Where am I? You're in a very small room with two exits, and there's a pile pile of bones on the floor. We just stood up now. Welcome to level three. Here, every step is danger, but speed is still essential. It's only our second ever view of level three. Ah! <laughs> well, yes. Warning, Stop Captain them. White, they're blind, oh, but I'm oh, Turn around, turn, turn around, around. quick. Walk forward. Stop. Turn to your right. right. Walk forward. forward fast. When we get an appearance from the Captain Whites, including one who seems to be taller than normal, but uh, even though it's bigger, it's still not exactly difficult to escape from them. Because they're not really that scary. Where am I? You're in a biggish room. You're at the top of a flight of steps. To, to the left of you, there are two doors. And to the left of them, there's another door with a portcullis in it. Can you walk down the steps, Chris? Yeah. So now they enter the level three clue room. My goodness, ah. they're both... It's the same quest, and we've had two clue rooms in one episode. It's still, it doesn't happen that often, that. Can we talk about this room? Because, oh, I have things to say. By all means. That's what so, you're here for. So the room um, on the clue table, there's a shield, a horn, and a jewel. Now, I think I vaguely remember watching this at the time. Because this is season two, and it's the whole thing of, like, there's no real bargaining in level three, you don't need riches... I can kind of forgive this for the fact that it's season two, and I feel that would be a bit more ingrained once people have watched it and like go on to the later seasons. That's fine. I completely understand. But when you see a shield with a white little orb in it, it's just like, whoa, look at me, like all glam like that. Why would you ignore it? You obviously need it. Well, this is. <laughs> It's it, it, this has always been a grey area for me. Um, the reason to ignore it would be because it's a weapon, and um, one of the main um, bits of bits of advice in the Adventurer's Code that the, um, the dungeon is given out, yeah. unless there's an indication to the contrary, you assume a weapon is the weapon of your enemy. Um, oh. But at the same time, it's not an offensive weapon, so yeah, you should you you would give it a little bit more leeway i would have thought for me the main reason uh, to go with the shield there was uh, is because it's level three human opposition yeah. is, is almost completely gone by now so corruptibility ceases to be a big factor exactly. down here so you should but there's really is unlikely mm -hmm. to be any use for a duel on its own yeah um but at the same time i do understand why they rejected the shield that reminds me of one of my favorite um fan fictions i actually reread the other day and it's like um they're going through and Skarkle comes up and they don't have anything to stop him. So like, I think it's Pickle just like, hit him with a ball and he just smashes him over the head. <laughs> or old Skarkle. Yeah. 
You see, you you enjoy the blood the blood curdling side of the, of the of nightmare still. Oh, don't absolutely. Pretend that, don't pretend that your sense of humor has become any less <laughs> become any like, any less morose and dark. My name my name on YouTube is Queen Creeps. Of course, my humor is morose and dark. <laughs> plug plug. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <Sneaky fuck. laughs> Absolutely. Take the horn and, and the jewel and the jewel, Chris. Right now, turn round, right round, and oh, turn, oh, turn oh, to your right, right a bit, right and walk forward, forward. quickly, quickly. No, no stop, stop, stop. But anyway, uh, after a, a brief bit of panic, when uh, they almost direct yeah. Christopher into straight into the path of an oncoming cavern white. Beyond that, they do manage to uh, straighten up and yeah. uh, and they disappear um, through the right hand exit. Keep going. <laughs> Go on. Where am I? You're in the the pit. horn you carry was Joshua's. The wall was brought here from another time, another place. Use your wits. We're now in the room where Richard and his team in season one met their fate. Mm -hmm. But Christopher is fortunate because they selected the horn from the level three clue room. Joshua's horn. The um, oh, hello, pickle. That's my girlfriend, pickle. Behind me, Chris, blow yeah. the arm. And again, and again, quick. And again, blow the horn. Again, again, again. And again. Right. Eight. Ah. 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 Well, investigate team, investigate. A few um, blows of the horn produce a surprisingly high-pitched two-note sound, um, but it does bring the wall down, as the Bible says, and so the walls yeah. came tumbling down. But having got rid of that, um, it reveals Merlin's meeting point in level three, an M talisman, um, oh. entirely animated, appears on the table. So we are now actually in uncharted territory, though. Um, they've now got beyond the point. Now then, walk forward see... to the table. Can you see anything at no. all? Oh. Oh. What's this? It's a cabinet. Oh. Oh. Thou wipes be gone! Yes. yes. Congratulations, Christopher. Your friends have brought you far and guided you well. Soon you may have more parts of your quest, but even when you have all the parts, you must still find the way out and make the parts whole again. As a reward for your progress, I gift you one single spell. It is the spell Unitas. What? Now, be brave. You have but a short way to go. The whites will return out fast while you may. Side step to your left. How close are they getting here? <laughs> I didn't actually know at the time that it was that it was just three levels I, 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 because no, Trey got yeah. had actually said in the first season the precise number of levels is not known, so I thought it, I, I thought it literally could carry on forever. At the end of season one, Trey God suggested that the Jericho Six Wall might have been the final hurdle. That was misleading, as it turned out. But because yeah. he said that, that again gave this impression. Oh my word! Now they got beyond that wall. Yeah, but like that. The, the exit could be could be on the other side of the next door. No, <laughs> the, 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 it, it gave that impression. <laughs> so anyway, uh, oh. they get a spell called Unitas. Unitas, or as if if it had been handed out in the level one clue room, I imagine it would be called Unit Ass. Uh, <laughs> and we know which wall monster would have handed it out. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> It's um we never find out alas what that spell was supposed to do. We never I, find um, out. I wonder if they might have messed up with it because like I remember Merlin saying the spell is Unitas and then one of the boys was just like, What? So yeah. <laughs> I, I have a bad feeling that maybe they might have written it down wrong and messed it up anyways. Well we will we'll, alas we, we well, I, I don't think we'll ever know. I I'm pretty sure Tim yeah. Child um, doesn't have the um, the scripts anymore, as as far as I know, and I don't think he I, can, think, I don't think he'll remember now. I so, think um, it might have been like because they were picking up pieces of the chalice that yeah. maybe it was like you know uniting all the pieces together. Yeah, but you, um, it's later established that you do that by just casting the name of the quest object. So yeah, 
Anyway, the staircase uh, at the end of the room serves no purpose other than to slow proceedings down. And uh, that's why it's removed later in the season, so they can just oh. walk out <laughs> through the doorway. Uh, it's when Julian's quest uh, in uh, Team 10 arrived there, um, there's no staircase anymore. I, I approve of getting rid of it because, uh, yes, it does slow things down a bit. By exiting this chamber, Christopher's team have unambiguously become the best team so far. And just walk forward. Where am I? You're in a small room. Do. To, in front of you, Do. on the left and on the right of the walls, are two doors. You just come Do. in through a door. Next to you is a gargoyle, Do. and he's calling out the words. Out, Do. Christopher, or the gargoyle's pessimism will drain Do. your confidence. It's already having a disastrous Do. effect upon your life force. Right, walk Chris, forward. walk forward. Go on, Chris, till we say stop. This is a different gargoyle um, from the yeah. one we saw at the end of season one. Um, that one had a weird hole in its face for water to come out of, apparently. Um, <laughs> this one isn't blue-coloured. Its chamber isn't blue-coloured. It's a very dark chamber. And it's a particularly uh, mouldy shade of green that the Gorgor's face yeah. um, has been coloured in. So um, I get the feeling that another gargoyle blundered past and sneezed all over it. I just find it really interesting that, like, this one just repeats doom over and over and then its mouth moves and then they obviously like just change their mind afterwards because then he actually talks but doesn't move his mouth <laughs> a subsequent appearance is mug appears to come back yeah um I, I don't think they ever quite settled on what they wanted to do with the gargoyle because the, there was another one in season three again using the same um foundation um artwork but with a moving mouth yeah. of a human mouth um, <laughs> what I would say about this one is it appears to be the same gargoyle that was in the Nightmare novella the first Nightmare novella really? yeah in that one um, Traegard and Folly are questing through the dungeon oh, and yeah. they they encounter an, a gargoyle which does nothing but say doom and its mm. eyes are glowing green and the green light seems to affect their, affect their yeah. ability to um, affect their confidence and and makes them become really depressed and eventually almost suicidal. They had a shield, a strange um, mirror-like shield with an inverted face. What oh, Traegard yeah. found was he could raise that shield in front of himself. This is um, <laughs> there's a sort of parallel of this in the next chamber, funnily enough. Um, but they found if he raised the shield in front of himself, it would reflect the light from the the gargoyle's eyes back onto the gargoyle. And that made the gargoyle so depressed, and it, it actually oh, jumped. Yeah. <laughs> it jumped off the ledge and destroyed itself in the cavern, cavern far below. So actually, it's actually um, a very, very dark moment looking back on it now. Um, yeah. <laughs> and again, I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure whether it's entirely wise to have teenagers reading books with those kind of concepts in it. But um, yeah. For kids, <laughs> that gargoyle, that gargoyle was actually standing on a long ledge rather than in a room. Um, so it just jumped off the ledge once it had yeah. become, uh, once it had become so in much in despair. For some reason, having been destroyed, that gargoyle then reappeared um, in the games hook section at the end of the book, um, when when the reader can play as a dungeoneer himself. Mm -hmm. Now here, Christopher doesn't have to hold up a shield in front of himself. He just has to walk out through the very very obvious wide open exit. Turn to your left, left and walk forward. forward quick. Go on, keep going. Do. Where am I? You're in a small room. In the room that I like, there's a face right in front of you. But I can't, I can't really snakes. see much more. Yeah, snakes. All right. It looks a bit like Medusa. Right. That aforementioned shield with a reflector service would have been very handy in the yep. very next room. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Amy. This is the fabulous... Medusa room. Um, so, oh Christ. What happens in here is that they come in just like, ooh, there's a Medusa, and then Traegar just gives There's a the gigantic face um, with yeah. snakes, and there were snakes in its hair. I wonder, yeah. what could it be? Oh, is mm. it a Medusa? Oh Thank God, you, yes, it is a Medusa. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Traegar delivers the unfortunate line of What you need here is the magic shield! But of course, you rejected it. 
this scene stuck with me because not only was it the dungeoneer that was affected, but for the first time it was the advisors as well. Oh dear. Dear, dear. It seems all I'm going to get out of you lot is a stony silence. And as for Christopher, he's certainly no better off. Like, they all turned to stone. That was terrifying. <laughs> what it establishes beyond any doubt is that the Medusa is the deadliest creature in the yeah. dungeon. It's probably oh, yeah. even deadlier than, than any of the sorcerers. Um, yeah. I think it only showed up twice, didn't it? Three times. Three times. Oh, three times. Yeah, there was, okay. it would appear twice in season two. It would also appear in uh, season three. You need um, a, a weapon just to be able to stand in the same room as it. If you don't have it, you mm. automatically lose then and there. So it's it's an extremely powerful uh, monster. So the fact that it can even affect the, the, the advisors, again, underlines that it's a powerful monster. Um, but it has to be said the stone effects are a little bit lame today. They were okay for yeah. 1988, but they do. It's just it's just basically a freeze frame of them coloured grey um, <laughs> photographs like that existed uh, since about 1900 so I'm not going to give them uh, give the series any points for that but it was okay <laughs> for the time but don't worry watchers things aren't quite so desperate as they appear look with me now beyond the dungeon wall Christopher, Paul, Kenneth, and Christopher, the dungeon defeats you, yet the dungeon salutes you. For the lack of a proper defense, you have failed in your quest, yet you have traveled further and braved more than any other team to enter the dungeon so far. Thus, you become our current champions. By far the best team, by far the best quest so far, but again, uh -huh. it ends in failure and defeat. Um, because... You know, I'm not absolutely sure why this was. There was no dismiss spell here. Um, and I don't know why that is, because even even though they're frozen stone, it's it, it would still require magic to restore them outside the dungeon. Yeah, I feel like it would have been a bit awkward just dismissing stone, <laughs> so... <laughs> well, I suppose like, it might it's be. It's fine, they're fine. Uh, Disney ending, everything's fine. <laughs> it has to be said, later seasons handle these sorts of things better, because by the time you've got that yeah. far, you don't deserve a dismiss spell. You deserve a bit, something a bit more respectful. So yeah. um, they, they introduced the Unite spell um, for, uh, to, to deal with that. Um, but yeah, they, they, just, they, they just seem to be in two places at once, everybody. They're, they're You've got statues of them sitting in the dungeon antechamber, and you've got, <laughs> and you've got them standing outside waving, like, waving in that cliched 1980s game show way, uh, 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 to, to say goodbye outside the dungeon. <laughs> so, they, reflecting on the team, they're right. perhaps they are perhaps a little unlucky. Um, as I say, it's a yeah. bit of a, a bit of a question mark over taking a weapon when there's no clue saying you should. But at the mm. same time, is it wise choosing a gem when you're in level three, when there's no human operate exactly. opposition opposition to bribe? So. I think maybe they could have thought like, oh, maybe we could have appeased Mogdred with the gem, but that no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I think Mogdred is above that sort of thing. Uh, Mogdred is, exactly. is is interested in power, not wealth. It's, He's got he's he's got his evils, but avarice isn't going to be one of them because it's that that sort of thing is beneath him. Yeah, of course. If, he, if if he wants wealth, he can just steal it very easily. <laughs> but anyway, the team but, yeah. are rightly saluted as the new champions by default, rather than actual champions. Um, they have been by far and away the best team. They're one of the best teams, um, I would say, in the history of the series. Not, so, to yeah. win, not to win, to, not to actually win. There have been yeah. champions in the history of Nightmare who were not as good as that team. Like, so. I'm not biased because Mersey said Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> I'm a little biased, tiny bit biased. But, like, I think in terms of, like, direction overall and, like, how they responded to the challenges yeah. and stuff, they were never, like, you know, they were never, like, they didn't not need into it. Like, they, they knew what they were They doing. didn't need prompting very often, especially yeah. after level one. Um, their movement was very fluid, um, which is why they absolutely raced through level two like they were, like they were mm -hmm. hurdlers or something. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they, they went a long way into level three as well. They went, they went a lot further than an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of uh, other teams 
who did get to level three um, down the years. Um, as I say, I think they were be- I rate them above a number of the, the sides that actually did win it. I rate them better than Julian's team. Spoiler, um, who, really? who won it? Oh, I rate, oh, definitely. Um, Julian's team weren't a bad side, um, but they had a lot of luck along the way. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I will. I, I'd agree with that. We will be pointing that out when we get to, get to the appropriate episodes. Um, mm-hmm. So this t- this team was right. This team was were hailed as champions, although it is only champions by default again. Rather yeah. than by rather than by right, as it were. Farewell then, champions, for the dungeon waits upon a fresh challenge. Let's find out from where. Enter, stranger. Name yourself, please. Mark Wixon. Well, Mark, call your advisors and let them introduce themselves. Jonathan, Matthew, Daniel, Carl. Who guides this dungeoneer? Daniel Allen from Whitney. Matthew Carey, also from Whitney. Jonathan Catchall, I'm from Whitney too. Mm, your challenge is accepted. In comes Mark Wixon and spoiler. Well, I'm not even going to say it actually. Uh, just, just, saying, <laughs> just saying spoiler already tells you exactly what's exactly. going to happen. Yeah. So um, I know this is only like the start of it. But I like to call this team the charm team because they, spoiler again, they definitely got through a lot of this yeah. through charming all the people in there. And you, yeah. you know the moment this guy walks in with the smile and everything, I'm just like, oh, bless, oh, you're, oh. you're going to be really good. Everyone was, <laughs> you, 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 you got this picture of, of, of um, dragons in level three wanting to give him a cuddle up, don't you? <laughs> he's, he, he, is a, he, he is a charmer as Mark Wicks and I think there's no doubt about that I actually feel really sorry for him because it must have been so embarrassing for him he's about 12 years old and he's got to go around chatting up men and then a gargoyle an ugly gargoyle but we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves here he's joined by advisors Jonathan, Matthew and Daniel the team all hail from Whitney Chagar gives the rule rundown and boots Mark through the door he doesn't, he doesn't the rules run down yet again takes too long and really should have been trimmed down again. But um, yeah. he's, he doesn't waste any time saying, are you sure you want to enter the challenge? He just perches on his head, turns him around, thrusts him through the door. <laughs> <laughs> Get in there! So face the dungeon door and step boldly forward. Where am I? Okay, Mark, you're in the room. There's looks, what looks like a, a lever to your right. And there's... Five stars at the end of the room. Five stars. You want me to move anywhere? No, there's something floating about on the room. The fire burns, the dungeon twists and turns. The wheel must be stopped if your quest is to start tea. Okay, Mark. Mark, the brake lever is over to your right. Okay, Mark, sidestep to your right. Keep going. Keep sidestepping. Okay, stop. Go forwards till I say stop. Okay, stop. Reach your arm out. Pull the lever, crunk. Roll lever! Oh. Warning team, complete temporal disruption imminent. Time is now the immediate enemy. Oh dear, temporal disruption complete. All adventuring must now cease until you phase with us once more. Temporal disruption sets in during oh. the Wheel of Fate. So you're just, just getting warmed up, you're just getting started, and then you've got to stop for a week. <laughs> that was my reaction when that happened. <laughs> I was already feeling a bit not that Christopher had, had lost after coming so close. And then just as a new team starting up... <laughs> <laughs> That was my, <laughs> that face I'm pulling is my reaction. Yeah. Listeners, I'm pulling God. a really, really pinched look on my face. <laughs> no, one of my favorite parts about that is that where Trey God's just like, you know, warning team, and they all just turn to him, just like, what are you on about <laughs> before they freeze? <laughs> it's very, it's very, I'm pretty sure those things are actually done later, but, um, uh, but the, yeah. so, sometimes they put in. Um, a, 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 a bit of video of the um, the team and their reaction can be interpreted that way when it shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
This is actually one of the great, all-time great sinister send-offs from Trey Guard we get in this episode. Yeah. Will this new team surpass our champions from Merseyside? Or will they falter here on level one? Ah, well. They say all life's a game, so join us again for the game where you can lose it. Your life, that is. Oh my oh, god! god I love that, oh my goodness, I, at least one of my mental scars came from watching that moment the first time. Oh, <laughs> he, is so, so, he is so brilliant in the first few seasons, Trey God. He's so, yeah. He is so sinister. Because I have a theory about that. I like to think, because, you know, I've read well, I've read all the books, but the first book where he's, you know, been away from his birthright for like 10 years and he's come back, I have a feeling that like it's a mix of him trying to sort of reclaim his childhood and in the sense he's just there just like oh look at me i'm playing the game now but also because he's you know had this birthright stolen for so long and he's had to go on the run basically it did mess with his mental sense a bit so by the time season three comes along he's finally sort of got his standing and roped it in a little bit but these first two seasons he doesn't care he's just going off <laughs> oh, it's, oh I, I i wish they hadn't changed it even, even if you can come up with a, a rationalization for the change in his personality they yeah. should have left it the way it was it was just perfect it really was <laughs> it was he he really underlined how dangerous and scary that the, yeah. what, what the dungeoneers are doing really is like handling explosives when they haven't been trying <laughs> uh, oh, no. so yeah um anyway let's uh, to sum up the episode my yeah. position is this is undoubtedly the best episode to this point mm -hmm. um it, including all of season one it was played at a helter skelter pace there's loads of new chambers to to vary things up and a number of new characters also make appearances um, it's one of the best teams um, dominates it, and uh, they go shooting through the shoot, fruit, sh fruiting shoe the levels, shooting <laughs> through the levels. <laughs> I'll do that again, and they go shooting through the levels um, at a really breakneck breakneck speed. Um, and there's a frequent air of pervading doom throughout, especially um, yeah. the level three scenes. Level three scenes are really dark and grimy and sinister and scary. That is nightmare as it should be, as it should always be. That episode, Absolutely. One of my all-time favorite episodes, season two, episode mm -hmm. three. What do you Yay. think? <laughs> um, no, I'd agree with you. Like I said, this is one of the ones that stuck with me. And for what we've discussed here, it's mm. just... I think it was the imposing thing of like by this point there hadn't been a winning quest and I was really excited for oh this is it this is the one and then it wasn't the one I was like oh but like yeah. I think it was like the seeing more of level three seeing Mogdra and seeing just Merlin as well just like this I think this yeah. was like the first time I kind of remember him and he was just this tall sort of imposing figure but he was clearly quite friendly as well yeah. and it's like ooh I'm getting into this now yeah. so yeah I, I think I, I do think the reason it really stands out for you is just it's one of the best episodes um, <laughs> it's, it's difficult it's, it's sometimes difficult to define what makes a good episode of Nightmare and yeah. what makes a bad one I can say without a moment's hesitation the worst episode of Nightmare is season 4 episode 16 it's just horrible if you, get, if you sit yeah. back if you sit through it I'm not going to go into to why right now but it's horrible um but, <laughs> but this um is one of the great ones this episode is one of the best ever um partly because it's played at an unusually fast pace for nightmare but also it's got such variety in it and it's got this this air of doom surrounding it and that makes it a yeah. great episode and that's probably what also among the reasons why it sticks in your head so well because yeah. it's just it's just a really it's how nightmare should be done Yep, I can agree with that. Wonderful. Before we go, I now have to uh, plug a few <laughs> things. You can find us um, on Twitter at Nightmare Pod. That's Nightmare with a K. No hyphens, no dots or other extremely phallic symbols. Uh, just all one word. Nightmare P-O-D. Nightmare Pod that's our twitter account i'll say that again nightmare with a k no spaces no pauses no dots <laughs> or, no dashes pod p-o-d no dots or dashes between the p or the o or the o and the d either no p's 
although there is a letter P, but it's a pod without P's in it. Nightmare Pod at Nightmare Pod. That is where you'll find our Twitter account. <laughs> Secondly, we can we have a Patreon account. You can get you can uh, donate to it at patreon.com slash nightmare pod. That's <laughs> nightmare pod. K with a K at the beginning. Thirdly, oh god, <laughs> you can almost so email us at broomcupboardsclub at gmail.com. Amy, do you have anything you want to plug for Queen Creeps? Yes, let me pull out the list. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, the, rem you can remember the spellings. <laughs> you can find me on YouTube. Um, if you just type in Queen Creeps, which is just one whole word, uh, I'm not spelling. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, Queen you can Creeps. Find me on there. You no can dots, find me on no there. spaces, no hyphens. <laughs> Sorry, do carry on. <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> okay, so you can find me there. You can find me on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash queen creeps. The Q and the C are capitalized. Um, you can. I don't do much work on my YouTube account at the minute because I actually just finished my master's in creative writing at university. So my That's YouTube master's on. spelt M A. <laughs> No, no hyphen, no dots, no spaces. Carry I'm on. Going to end you. <laughs> but I. You know do... what? That's exactly how Mr. H speaks to me towards the end of most of these podcasts. <laughs> oh, Chris! But yeah, I'm going to. Um, I've been doing a load of collaboration work with other channels, so you can find me on Final Boss Fight, where I do tabletop games and Dungeons and Dragons and all that sort. Um, you can also find me on internet remix where i do a lot of the same thing plus different tabletop things just other collaborative streams you can also find me at man on the internet where i do a lot of voice acting a lot of singing and that you can all find that on youtube or on twitch.tv where we stream and yeah that's pretty much it i uh, we hope to have you a guest again many times in the future amy it's been a, it has been a laugh quite oh, genuinely absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for joining us and as i say i i i, I hope you'll join us again soon thank you for listening and uh don't have nightmares watch them instead bye now for now bye, bye for now <laughs> and that's it we've done it Yay! Yay!